Probably the most critical problem in the other America is the economic problem. By the millions, people in the other America find themselves perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. But the problem is not only unemployment, it's under a sub-employment. People who work full-time jobs for part-time wages. Most of the poor people in our country are working every day. The fact is that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. Hi, everyone, and welcome to MMT Mondays. Tonight we're going into part two of our deep dive into the benefits of a federal job guarantee. In part two, we will look at how a federal job guarantee levels the playing field by allowing us to view the bigger picture when it comes to tackling social and economic injustices head on. So we start out tonight with a micro level look at a macro level problem of racial and economic injustices in the job market. In our first video, we see that someone missing out on a chair in a game of musical chairs might seem in insignificant, but viewed from a macro level reveals the larger issue facing those overlooked in the workforce. The lack of chairs determines who is truly unemployed. Those who are least advantaged or left standing in this example tend to end up being the one left without a job. We can't just design programs to attack the barriers but must have the jobs available to address the root cause, which is not enough jobs to hire all of those who need one. Another view of the labor market. Why is she crying? Well, she didn't get to sit down. Well, why didn't she get to sit down? Was it because she wasn't fast enough? Because she didn't try hard enough? Because a group of the kids, probably the boys, bullied her out of a seat? Okay. Uh, was it because she didn't know the rules? No. The reason she's unemployed, the reason she's standing up, is because there aren't enough chairs in the circle. However, if that circle was 150 million chairs with constant flux on and off, we might think, oh, gee whiz, we notice that the people who are standing around, they tend to be black. They tend to be, if we're conservative, lazy. Uh, they tend to be people without skills. They tend to be people, and from a progressive perspective, the emphasis will be on barriers to their participation on equal terms with other workers in the pursuit of chairs. Uh, conservatives will say, well, it's their fault. They're just not trying hard enough. Okay. No. The reason they're not sitting down, the reason they're not employed is because there are not enough chairs. That's the proximate cause. Well, but, but well, what do we make then of all those other causes? You know, the lack of training, uh, employment discrimination, uh, all of the factors that, that, that affect. Well, that's what determines who is unemployed. So that's the proximate cause of who suffers the unemployment. And not surprisingly, it's the people who are least, a dis least advantaged in the community who end up standing. Now, their disadvantage may be one thing, it may be another. Uh, the unemployment rates amongst disabled unemployed workers are astronomical. Uh, we know the unemployment ra rates amongst blacks and other people of color are higher, always, than the unemployment rates of white, reflective of all of the, the forms in which racism and, and, and discrimination of various sorts uh, operates in the economy. Okay, so it's an important factor, an important target of progressive policy. But would we be able to solve the problem of unemployment if we addressed all those problems? No. Would we be able to solve the problem of chairlessness if we taught every child who was chairless what they needed to know to get a seat the next time? No, because the time we, next time we ran the game, there'd still be a kid standing 
Okay? And the kid would probably have a lot of the same characteristics as the earlier kid, disadvantaged in some way or another. Okay? So it's understandable that people looking at the labor market, where the number of chairs can't be counted, okay, and, or, or where they're not counted, and where the number of people who want to participate in work are, are not counted, people may be naturally led to believe, oh, it's, it's all these individual characteristics and societal barriers that are the cause of unemployment. So we'll get rid of those, and the problem of unemployment will go away. And then programs are designed to address the problem of unemployment in that way, and lo and behold, even the ones that are successful, even the ones that have high placement rates, six months after the program, our graduates are employed. Have they done anything to reduce the total level of unemployment? No, because the job that their graduate got meant that someone else who would have gotten that job is now without a job, another candidate for their program. Okay? So in order to solve the problem of unemployment, we've got to close the job gap. That's the proximate cause of unemployment. And we probably can't address all of the other problems, which still would exist. Even if there were chairs for everybody, there'd still be plenty of opportunities for, for discrimination in who gets the better chairs uh, and so forth. Uh, but without solving the problem of chairlessness, of unemployment by providing jobs, we're probably not going to be able to solve those other problems because there's too many ways that the more privileged can stay more privileged. <laughs> too many ways that they can up the ante uh, if... Uh, uh, disadvantaged people uh, are given a break. Okay, we'll do a little bit more or press a little bit harder back or whatever it takes to keep our privilege. Okay. Now, when I uh, first uh, developed an interest in this problem, when I first began, it was actually in the aftermath of the 1981-83 double dip recession. Uh, I had only become acquainted in 1980 with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, and what for me was a kind of eye-opening notion that uh, access to jobs and other uh, uh, economic needs and, and, and uh, goods uh, were viewed officially, formally, in international law as human rights on a par with the right to freedom of speech and other things that uh, are cherished in our Constitution. And so, at the tail end of that recession, I had a sabbatical coming on. I said, well, gee whiz, I wonder what it would take to secure the right to work. What would it cost uh, if all of the millions of unemployed workers as a result of that recession uh, were instead offered jobs, paying decent wages uh, during the, the, the course of the recession? Uh, and uh, this is the a chart that uh, reported the results of that research updated and you know perfected over the next few years in the 1989 book uh, and the total cost uh, these are nominal from year to year terms uh, was almost uh, you know uh, 1.2 trillion dollars uh, but of course the 1.2 trillion dollars would have generated additional tax revenue because the wages on which the wages paid um, to employ those people would be collected by the government. So that if you count what the income taxes they would pay, not tax collections in general, because the program would also have had a stimulative effect and lots of other people would have paid more taxes too, but just the taxes that the program participants would pay, payroll taxes and income taxes, came to 245, almost 250 billion, it's about 20% of the total cost of the program. Uh, then another part of my research was, well, how much would the government save if all these people were employed rather than unemployed? Well, there'd be a whole bunch of benefits that would not have to be provided uh, without even taking, uh, uh, making any changes in eligibility requirements. Unemployment insurance benefits that would not be paid because the individual was employed. Um, uh, AFDC benefits because the individual was employed. Uh, food stamp benefits uh, that would be smaller or maybe non-existent because the individual would be employed. Uh, and so I tried to catalog, and this was really the hardest part of the research, all of the savings that uh, uh, all three levels of governments would enjoy as a result of um, uh, putting all those folk to work. Uh, and the total came to 941 billion, which was about 60% of the, no, 941 was the net program cost after we 
you know, take out the taxes that are paid. 724 billion, I thought that didn't sound like 80%, 60%, that's the 60%. Uh, so together, uh, the tax revenue generated directly by the program and the savings generated directly by the program paid for 80% of it. Okay? And most of those savings were generated, if you, you know, look at the, the net figures down here, in the recession years, those two, 82, 83. In other words, if the program were in place, then you would eliminate the characteristic of recessions whereby unemployment creates more unemployment. The unemployed worker stops buying, and then a business which otherwise is totally healthy uh, loses, uh, uh, loses trade and, and has to lay off workers. And so unemployment feeds on itself. So Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 1963 March on Washington is widely remembered for his famous phrase of I have a dream, dealing with the freedoms that come with the right to vote. What is often overlooked is that the 1963 March on Washington was for jobs and freedom. Jobs and freedom went hand in hand in Dr. King's vision of America, but not just any job. King envisioned a government-funded job guarantee. In our second video we will look at tonight, Dr. Matthew Forstater discusses how MLK saw a federal job guarantee as quintessential to full employment, economic security, and racial justice. A job guarantee program stood at the heart of Dr. King's vision. Under a job guarantee program, the federal government would hire all of those willing and able to work at a living wage. The theme of job creation runs through the writings of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Not just job creation in general, but specifically a government-funded job guarantee. In an article published in Look Magazine just after his assassination, Dr. King wrote that, we call our demonstration a campaign for jobs and income because we feel that the economic question is the most crucial that black people and poor people generally are confronting. There is a literal depression in the African American community. When you have mass unemployment in the African American community, it's called a social problem. When you have mass unemployment in the white community, it's called a depression. The fact is, there is a major depression in the African American community. The unemployment rate is extremely high and among African American youth it goes up as high as 40% in some cities. Nearly 50 years after these words were written, yet another generation has witnessed the inability of a booming economy to provide gainful employment for every person willing and able to work, a point well understood by Dr. King. Economic expansion alone cannot do the job of improving the employment situation of African Americans. It provides the base for improvement, but other things must be constructed upon it, especially if the tragic situation of youth is to be solved. In a booming economy, African American youth are afflicted with unemployment as though in an economic crisis. They are the explosive outsiders of the American expansion. As politicians and media figures laud the relatively lower aggregate unemployment rates, more careful observers note the hidden unemployment that the official numbers do not account for and caution the optimists that official unemployment figures go down not only when the unemployed find work, but also when discouraged workers drop out of the labor force. Those in prison are also disproportionately young, black, and male, and are not included in official unemployment figures. In addressing these tremendous challenges, Dr. King's writings have a laser-like focus on job creation as addressing multiple concerns and carrying multiple benefits. The nation will also have to find the answer to full employment, including a more imaginative approach than has yet been conceived for neutralizing the perils of automation. Today, as the skilled and semi-skilled African-American attempts to mount the ladder of economic security, 
he finds himself in competition with the white working man at the very time when automation is scrapping 40,000 jobs a week. Though this is perhaps the inevitable product of social and economic upheaval, it is an intolerable situation and African Americans will not long permit themselves to be pitted against white workers for an ever decreasing supply of jobs. The energetic and creative expansion of work opportunities in both the public and private sectors of our economy is an imperative worthy of the richest nation on earth whose abundance is an embarrassment as long as millions of poor are imprisoned and constantly self-renewed within an expanding population. Dr. King reiterated over and over again his proposal that government become an employer of last resort. We need an economic bill of rights. This would guarantee a job to all people who want to work and are able to work. It would mean creating certain public service jobs. We must develop a federal program of public works, retraining and jobs for all, so that none, white or black, will have cause to feel threatened. Dr. Forstater goes on to explain how King saw that a federal job guarantee would not only address the problems of unemployment, Dr. King also affirmed the program's ability to provide needed and meaningful services to communities across the country. Dr. King envisioned a new economic bill of rights. This would guarantee a job to all those who want to work and are able to work. King's vision extended to all of those left behind or underemployed. This crossed the racial divide because it not only benefited minorities, but also poor whites as well. We see that the weight of discrimination does not bear down on only those of color, but also on the poor white population, although not as blatant. What makes discrimination so evil is because poor white people will only serve to benefit their oppressors. Dr. King concludes that both black and white will be harmed unless something grand and imaginative is done. The unemployed, poverty-stricken white man must realize that they are in the same boat as the African-American man. Together, they can exert massive pressure on the government. Together, they can get jobs for all. Together, they can form a grand alliance for the good of all. Dr. King's proposal was that anyone ready and willing to work would be assured a public service job. His vision thus extended to all those left behind, including unemployed and poor whites. While African Americans form the vast majority of America's disadvantaged, there are millions of white poor who would also benefit from such a bill. The moral justification for special measures for African Americans is rooted in the robberies inherent in the institution of slavery. Many poor whites, however, were the derivative victims of slavery. As long as labor was cheapened by the involuntary servitude of the black man, the freedom of white labor, especially in the South, was little more than a myth. It was free only to bargain from the depressed base imposed by slavery upon the whole of the labor market. Nor did this derivative bondage end when formal slavery gave way to de facto slavery of discrimination. To this day, the white poor also suffer deprivation and the humiliation of poverty if not of color. They are chained by the weight of discrimination, though its badge of degradation does not mark them. It corrupts their lives, frustrates their opportunities, and withers their education. In one sense, it is more evil for them because it has confused so many by prejudice that they have supported their own oppressors. Black and white, we will all be harmed unless something grand and imaginative is done. The unemployed, poverty-stricken white man must be made to realize that he is in the very same boat with the African American. Together they could exert massive pressure on the government to get jobs for all. Together they could form a grand alliance. Together they could merge all people for the good of all. Dr. King clearly distinguished a job guarantee from training programs. Too often, he wrote, 
training becomes a way of avoiding the issue of unemployment. The orientation should be jobs first, training later. Unfortunately, the jobs policy of the federal programs has largely been the reverse, with the result that people are being trained for non-existent jobs. While the development of skills and supportive educational experiences are important characteristics of a job guarantee program, the jobs should nevertheless be jobs and understood as such, not given the false label of training. For Dr. King, a job guarantee program is capable of reconciling these various requirements as conceived around the idea that new forms of work that enhance the social good will have to be devised for those for whom traditional jobs are not available. In Where Do We Go From Here, Dr. King elaborated his vision of a job guarantee program. First, development of skills and education are outcomes, not prerequisites of the program. Second, the jobs are producing community and public services that are in short supply and that benefit the neediest communities. Third, the program generates incomes for individuals and families that have unmet needs. Fourth, there are numerous social psychological benefits for individuals, families, communities, and the nation. The big new attractive thrust of African American employment is in the non-professional services. A high percentage of these jobs are in public employment. The human services, medical attention, social services, neighborhood amenities of various kinds are in scarce supply in this country, especially in localities of poverty. The traditional way of providing manpower for these jobs, degree-granting programs, cannot fill all the niches that are opening up. The traditional job requirements are a barrier to attaining an adequate supply of personnel, especially if the number of jobs expands to meet existing need. The expansion of human services can be the missing industry that will soak up the unemployment that persists in the United States. It can be the missing industry that would change the employment scene in America. The expansion of human services is that industry. It is labor intensive, requiring manpower immediately rather than heavy capital investment as in construction or other fields. It fills a great need not met by private enterprise. It involves labor that can be trained and developed on the job. The growth of the human services should be rapid, should be developed in a manner ensuring that the jobs will be generated not primarily for professionals with college and postgraduate diplomas, but for people from the neighborhoods who can perform important functions for their neighbors. As with private enterprise, rigid credentials have monopolized the entry routes into human services employment but less educated people can do many of these tasks now performed by the highly educated as well as many other new and necessary tasks. A job guarantee provides the framework for income maintenance, skill development, and community service provisioning. Dr. King also believed that it could support goals in other areas such as housing and education. Work of this sort could be enormously increased, and we are likely to find that the problems of housing and education, instead of preceding the elimination of poverty, would themselves be affected if poverty is first abolished. The poor transformed into purchasers will do a great deal on their own to alter housing decay. Health and child care are other areas where a job guarantee program may serve as a vehicle for progressive social policies. If the wage benefits package includes medical coverage and child care, not only would this guarantee workers and their families coverage, but it could also pressure firms in the private sector to match such benefits. Dr. King recognized that a job guarantee 
could not take the place of all social programs. He therefore supported comprehensive legislation that would guarantee an income to all who are not able to work. Some people are too young, some are too old, some are physically disabled, and yet in order to live, they need an income. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. supported a job guarantee throughout his life. It was a concrete part of his dream, but he did not view it as utopian or overly idealistic. This country has the resources to solve any problem once that problem is accepted as national policy. By supporting the provision of community services, it raises the possibility of rebuilding America so that private affluence is not accompanied by public squalor of slums and distress. In 1963, Dr. King wrote, I would challenge skeptics to give such a bold new approach a test for the next decade. Unfortunately, we know we did not face up his challenge at that time, but it is not too late to take up that challenge now as we enter the new millennium. So as we can see, 56 years ago, Dr. King challenged those doubtful of his proposal to give such a bold and new approach a test for the next decade. Dr. King saw that the issues of economic inequalities in this country were much larger than black and white. It was a problem with our whole way of life. He knew it couldn't change overnight, but we have to start somewhere once we could see that bigger picture. This country has the resources to solve any problem once that problem is accepted as national policy. The poor turned into purchasers will do a tremendous amount towards transforming decay. The money spent would be more than amply justified by the benefits that would accrue to the whole nation. In the meantime, his appeal has gone largely unheeded. Now is the time to take up his challenge and move towards the full employment economy of Dr. King's vision. What better way to usher in a new year after experiencing so much suffering and unforeseen tragedies than to finally live up to the challenge that MLK gave all of us in his grand dream for a new America. Thank y'all so much and have a great week. What I'm simply saying is that we are going to demand what is ours. And my friends, the resources are here in America. The question is whether the will is here. There's something wrong with the policies, the priorities, and the purposes of our nation now. And we've got to say it in no uncertain terms. And I simply say to you that I'm afraid that our government is more concerned about winning an unjust war in Vietnam than about winning the war against poverty right here at home. And I say, if we will stand and work together, we will bring into being that day when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, we will bring into being that day when America will no longer be two nations, but it will be one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you.